What's up, dude? So if this setup looks the same as it did yesterday, that's because it is. Um, I'm recording two videos in one day. <laughs> Today, we are talking about the case of Jessica Chambers. I am just going to give you a timeline of how things happened. I, like, there's a lot because they got their phone records. So that's kind of what we're going off of. And of course, there's some security cam footage as well that they were able to piece together this very, very good timeline. So let's just jump right into it because there's kind of a lot. <laughs> On December 2nd, 2014, Jessica Chambers, 19 years old, goes to the emergency room for some medicine in Mississippi. This isn't really like a huge part of the story, but it was just something that I think should be mentioned. Jessica lived in Cortland, Mississippi. Quentin Tellis goes with her to the emergency room to get some medicine. Quentin and Jessica met around Thanksgiving in 2014 and they knew each other for about two weeks before Jessica ends up passing away. The next day, Quentin texts Jessica, I'm horny, and she responds, oh lord. Their conversation goes on for a while, and Jessica tells him that his mom and sister are home and that they would freak out. So this shows that Jessica wouldn't go to Quentin's house when his family was around. That's just something to remember for later on. I'm going to bring this back up again. On December 4th, Jessica breaks the screen on her phone, which makes phone calls sound garbled and just like really difficult to understand. So I think since it's 2014, texting was a thing, of course, but that's why they just revert over to texting because phone calls were hard to hear. Quentin texts Jessica again, I'm horny. And again, she says, oh, oh Lord. On the 5th, Jessica asks him for money to eat and he responds with a sexual proposition. So they definitely had a flirty kind of sexual relationship and they did have sex at least once within like the two week span that they knew each other. Jessica responds saying that all she needs is $6. Just minutes later, Quentin is seen on surveillance video at the M&M gas station walking across the street to Jessica's car, and then he walks back to his driveway. So we can kind of infer that he had just given her the $6. So that M&M gas station was across the street from his house. The morning of December 6th, between 12.32 and 10.04 a.m., Quentin is making... Um, phone calls that bounce off of a tower in Pope, Mississippi. So he was either at his house or at the M&M gas station that was right across the street. At 8.55 a.m., Quentin is caught on surveillance at M&M grabbing breakfast wearing a white shirt and shoes, a dark do-rag, and jeans. Between 9.01 and 9.02 a.m., Jessica wakes up and sends out a text. The data from her phone pins at her home on Carlisle Road. At 9.06 a.m., Quentin's mom's white Chevy Suburban leaves the house and drives up U.S. 51. At 10.04 a.m., Jessica calls Quentin and they're on the phone for about 69 seconds. Jessica then goes into M&M and makes a purchase at 10.08 a.m. A minute later, Quentin texts her saying, I'm ready. At 10.10, Jessica is on cameras at M&M talking to two people and no one else like was with her. It was just her and these two people that she was visiting with. She leaves and can be seen walking on video, driving um, into Quentin's driveway and then the two head south on US 51. So Quentin's mom leaves and then he texts her, I'm ready. And then she comes over. So she was probably just like hanging out at the gas station for a while, waiting for him to say that like the coast is clear. For the next 32 minutes, Jessica and Quentin drive circles on Cortland back roads. And honestly, in a small town, that's not like out of the ordinary. There's just like, like I live in a fairly small town. It's not like super small, but there's nothing to do in the town where I live. So literally we just like drive around. Like, that's our entertainment. So this isn't really an odd thing to me to hear that they did. Especially being 19. Like, that's totally something I did when I was 19. <laughs> I still do. During that time, Jessica calls Kesha Meyer. Jessa, Jessica and Kesha were best friends. At 10.33 a.m., Jessica calls Kesha again, and then at some point, they pick her up. At 10.47 a.m., Quentin calls his sister, LaQuinta Tellis. Quentin and... La Quinta. I love those names together. Two minutes later, the group circles back to the M&M and Quentin gets out. Jessica and Kesha drive off. At 10.55 a.m., Quentin walks back over to M&M and he is now wearing black shoes, lighter pants, a red shirt and hat, and a plaid coat. 
Between 11.05 a.m. and 5.29 p.m., Jessica is at home and Quentin is texting her, I need you, and she responds, what you need? Some lovin'. And once again, she says, oh lord, can't. Between 2.21 p.m. and 4.23 p.m., Jessica's phone is silent, and that's because her mom says that she was taking a nap at that time. At 4.23 p.m., Quentin calls Jessica, waking her up. Between 3.24 p.m. and 4.15 p.m., Quentin's girlfriend at the time, Chiquita Jackson, who is in Monroe, Louisiana, is trying to contact Quentin to get him to send her some money so that way she can come and visit him. At 4.09 p.m., Chiquita texts Quentin again saying, I'm trying to come up, call me. Between 4.21 and 5.29 p.m., Quentin's phone is pinging and he's at home. Jessica is trying to get a hold of Kesha between 4.23 and 4.36 p.m., but Kesha's phone is out of minutes, so she's unable to reach her at all. As Jessica is still trying to reach Kesha, she texts Quentin that she'll go get something to eat with him if he pays for it. At 4.59 p.m., Jessica and Quentin talk on the phone for 33 seconds. So notice, like, she keeps asking him for money or, like, to go out to eat, but she wants him to pay for it. And then he has his girlfriend that's not in town, who he is cheating on. And she, too, expects him to pay for her to come up and see him. Kind of a weird pattern. I'm not saying, I mean, I sound judgy, but I'm not saying anything about it. I'm just saying, like, notice that. Because it's kind of a weird little thing that you see is like recurring and keeps happening now because Jessica's asked him for money twice and then this other girlfriend is also asking him for money. Quentin can be seen once again on surveillance video waiting or excuse me walking to Eminem and still is in his red outfit. He paces around outside but doesn't go in or makes a or make a purchase between 508 and 511 p.m. At 512 p.m. Quentin begins walking south into the dark. He calls Jessica, but it seems like she doesn't answer right away, and then she calls him back at 5.20 p.m. The M&M security cameras show Jessica talking to someone who's off the screen. She picks up a penny, goes inside, and makes a purchase, then comes out and pumps gas between 5.24 and 5.30 p.m. Quentin calls Jessica back, and this is the last call that he makes for the next 48 minutes. He later tells investigators that this call was him asking Jessica to come and pick him up. Jessica's phone data shows that she's heading towards Batesville. So Cortland and Batesville are only 5.1 miles or like roughly eight minutes apart. So they're super close. Quinton tells investigators that the pair ate dinner at the Taco Bell in Batesville. At 6.17 p.m., Quinton calls his sister as he and Jessica leave the Taco Bell. They head back south towards Cortland. The phone call to Quinton's sister was the only phone call or text made by him between 5.34 and 7.42 p.m. Between 6.22 and 6.25 p.m., Jessica is still attempting to reach Kesha because she doesn't know her phone's out of minutes. At 6.30 p.m., Jessica and Quentin get back to Cortland and go to his house where his mom's Suburban is sitting in the driveway. He tells investigators at this time he and Jessica are sitting in her car just smoking weed. But before this, Quentin later tells investigators that the area that the two of them went and had sex at was behind the house, so it couldn't be seen from the house. So they drove the car off to the secluded spot, had relations, and then came back, kind of parked next to the house, and were just smoking weed. While Jessica and Quentin sit in her car smoking, she's still trying to get a hold of Kesha. At 6.48 p.m., Jessica calls her mom for the last time, and this conversation lasts for 76 seconds. Her mom says that she doesn't hear any background noise or music, which is unusual, she thought. So this made her think that Jessica was probably with somebody else. Quentin confirms this as he and she were, in fact, together. Between 6.49 and 7.26 p.m., neither Jessica or Quentin were using their phones. Five women were trying to get a hold of Quentin during this time, but he doesn't answer any of them. One of the women that was texting him was Chiquita, and she texted him, oh well, probably because she couldn't get a hold of him um, about coming to visit. At 7.10 p.m., a vehicle is seen leaving his house. Quentin tells investigators that it's his uncle, Sammy. 16 minutes later, a pair of headlights appear and then disappear from the driveway next to Quentin's house, the exact same area that he and Jessica had been parked at, according to the earlier timeline when they went and had sex. 
The video footage isn't super helpful because it was so dark. So the video, of course, was super grainy and it's just hard to make anything out. Authorities point out that the, the woman who lives there is at work and Quentin's sister is inside the store. Around 7.29 p.m., Quentin's mom, Suburban, leaves the house and goes to Eminem for about 20 minutes. A minute later, Jessica's phone patterns have moved west, like a notable ways to, like, oh, like weirdly far away all of a sudden that she's, like, out west. This is location on Huron Road where Jessica is found lying next to her car. Both she and the car are on fire. Her car keys are later found alongside the road near where she and the car were. A flammable liquid had been poured on her body, up her nose, and down her throat. She passed away the next day because, or excuse me, she passed away the next morning because of her injuries. So let's jump back in the timeline where we left off with Quentin. At 7.42 p.m., his phone wakes up. So he had probably completely turned off his phone so it couldn't be traced anywhere. And he tries to give Jessica a call, but of course he gets her voicemail. So he leaves her a message and then he follows that message up with a text saying, Bay, my friend is coming over tonight. I'll call you tomorrow. Good night, sweet dreams. I don't know about you, but like, yeah, if I had just murdered someone, I'd probably try to create an alibi and say, oh yeah, well, I tried calling them. And then one of my friends was coming over, so that's why I didn't see them. And that's why, like, you know, I was, you know, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I was with a friend. I was out doing something else. Quentin later tells authorities that an in-town girlfriend was coming over and when he was questioned about whether or not that girlfriend would confirm his alibi, he changes his story and says that Chiquita was the one that came over. Weird, cause she's in Louisiana. Anyways, at 7.46 p.m. he calls Chiquita and lets her know that he's walking to his sister's house to borrow her Tahoe. Later on, investigators note that there is a cut across trail that goes from where Jessica was found on Huron Road to the subdivision where Quentin's sister lives and later Jessica's keys were found in a yard along that route, like off the road thrown into the yard. And he, so Quentin only borrowed his sister's car once before and that was when he took it to like get it washed. So kind of weird that he all of a sudden just like went and borrowed her car. So hmm, kind of seems to me like he drove a vehicle out one way and then when he came back, he had to borrow a car to get back home. But that's neither here nor there. Between 7.46 and 8 p.m., his phone is quiet once again. But between 7.50 and 7.52, the m, &M security cameras catch a vehicle pulling into his driveway to a storage shed and it stays there for a minute and 42 seconds. Now, Quentin claims that that's because there was like a gas can in that shed. But when they look back at the videos, there wasn't a gas can on the video. Nothing like that was seen on video. At 8 p.m., a vehicle that matches the description of Quentin's sister's car can be seen on security footage heading towards Batesville at a very high speed. Quentin claims that it could be him leaving to get a green dot card so he can send it to Chiquita so she can come visit him. He said it, it could be him. Not that it was him. Not that it wasn't him. But it, it could have been him. Weird. So a green dot card is just like a prepaid visa card. So it makes sense that that's what he was going to send Chiquita. At 8.04 p.m., Jessica's phone shuts off after it gets too hot and completely just shuts down and gets burned out in, because of the fire. At 8.07 p.m., Latroy Rudd and Glenn Williams call 911 after they see the car on fire. Two minutes later, first responders arrive on the scene and find Jessica burned beyond all recognition. Data from Quentin's cell phone confirms his story that between 8.15 and 8.23 p.m., he went to Piggly Wiggly and Fred's to buy the Visa card. He makes a call to Chiquita during this time as well. He calls her five times in about 23 minutes, but he never makes calls to her between 4.25 p.m. and 7.46 p.m., which is about the time frame that Jessica goes missing and then is found burning. In the surveillance video from Fred's, he's wearing the red outfit without the jacket when he purchases the card. At 8.57 p.m., he appears back at Eminem again, but this time he's wearing white shoes and jeans, a white shirt, and a lighter colored jacket. He claims that he took a bath and then he changed. 
A guy at Eminem tells a story about Jessica and her car burning, but Quentin doesn't interact with this man. However, he still does tell investigators that that's when he hears about Jessica's death while at Eminem. So, like, he just tries to place himself there. Even though Quentin was in um, near constant contact with Jessica, after hearing the news, he never once tries to call or text her. Which is, like, I have mixed feelings about that. I feel like, yes, it is weird if I heard that one of my relatives was in a crazy accident or got hurt. I would send them a text just so when they do check their phone, they got a nice message from me checking in on them. So it is kind of weird that he doesn't say anything to her, especially they had been, you know, kind of sleeping together, kind of dating, kind of not really, but they had been hanging out. So, and like throughout this whole thing, they are talking a lot. So it is weird that he doesn't reach out. He later admits to deleting her texts, calls, and contact information for whatever reason from his phone. I don't know why you would do that. That's so weird, Quentin. The information provided was from the phone company's records. So that's kind of where the case is today. Um, I believe they're still going to trial for this. I think they're still trying to figure out a way to prove that he did in fact do it. So yeah, this one, like, okay, this timeline of events took me forever to do. So if you guys want a part two, let me know and I'll go through and talk about the aftermath and whatnot. I actually might just do that for mo my Monday's case. So if you guys want to see more information after the fact on this case, be sure to watch on Monday. But that is it for me today. I hope that you guys found this video interesting. I mean, as tragic as it is, um, please leave your thoughts in the description in the description box, in the comments down below. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. But that is it for me. I will see you guys back here on Monday. Bye guys.